Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the final webinar for the ALA seminar series for 2022. We're very excited to be here. My name is Martin Westgate. I lead the science and decision support team here at the Atlas of Living Australia. And, um, and we're really thrilled to be here today to be hearing about uh, ecological modelling. Um, before we get started, I would like to acknowledge that we're in Canberra, which is Ngunnawal country, and I'd like to pay my respects and the respects of the organisation to uh, the elders of the Ngunnawal people, uh, past and present. Um, you will notice, those of you calling in from, uh, dialing in from home, that there's a, a chat function in, in the system that you're viewing this from. So if you'd like to tell us about the country you're calling in from today, then we'd love to hear that. Um, there's also a little poll in there somewhere, so if you want to tell us a little about yourself, we'd love to hear it. So, yeah, we're here today to talk about, about ecological modelling, which sounds a little bit um, perhaps technical, and it is in some respects, but I, I think the context here is that, you know, uh, we're, we're broadcasting today from the Atlas of Living Australia in Canberra, and we're an organisation that stores information on who's seen which critters out in the wild. 100 million observations or more of plants, animals, fungi, viruses, that sort of thing. And we're part of a global network that stores 2 billion observations. Now, of course, that's, um, that's a huge amount of information. And, and once you get to that sort of scale, um, we don't just want to store it. We want people to use it. We want people to, to learn something about the natural world from that data. And the tools that we need to do that are, are statistical. And so, um, the, and, and there is, of course, an, uh, an entire research sector uh, a, a group of people in universities and, and institutions around the country who are, who are working hard to understand how the natural world functions and, and what we can learn about it from data providers like the Atlas. And so we're really fortunate today to be hearing from three speakers from different institutions. So uh, in, in order in which they'll be appearing, we have Simon Ferrier from CSIRO. Thanks, Simon. And we've got Carla Archibald from Deakin University and uh, Payal Baal from uh, University of Melbourne and Invertebrates Australia. So each of our speakers today has kindly volunteered their time to tell you a little bit about the research that they've done in the past and that is, is coming up in the future. And, um, and it's a, uh, one last thing I'd say before I hand over to our speakers, who are, of course, the experts, is that it's a very dynamic field. And so we're really privileged today to be hearing um, about the experience of people on the cutting edge of what you can learn about biodiversity from, from resources such as ours. So first speaker today is, is Simon. Um, do you have your slides ready to share there, Simon? I do, Martin, to see if that comes up. Yeah, perfect. Full screen, everything's fine. Thanks so much. Over to you. That's, that, that's great. Thanks, Martin, and good afternoon, everybody. It's, it's really nice to, to be here and to talk for about 10 minutes about advances in, in biodiversity modelling from the perspective of why, what, and, and how. And... I'm going to take a bit of a trip down memory lane to, to get started. Believe it or not, and I'm showing my age here, I've been modelling biodiversity for almost 40 years now. In fact, it's probably exactly 40 years this year. Um, the first modelling I ever did was, was of a, a single species, the rufous scrub bird, a, a threatened bird species that lives in northeast New South Wales in southeast Queensland. I did my PhD on, on that species and I did a lot of what later came to be known as species distribution modeling. So that's going a long way back. Then when I finished my PhD, I was lucky enough to, to work for almost 20 years for um, New South Wales state government agencies, starting with the National Parks and Wildlife Service there. And I then started to apply modeling to a much larger number of species, actually several thousand species that, that work then fed into some major decisions that were made um, in, in the forests of eastern New South Wales about which areas of forest would be taken out of timber production and put into the, into the protected area system. So a lot has changed in, in, in modelling since those days. And I'm just first of all going to talk about the changes that have, that have occurred with the why and the what, and then I'll get to the, to the how. But in terms of, of the why and what, a lot of that early modelling, particularly the modelling that I was involved with, was very much focused on just modelling distributional patterns of biodiversity ac across space alone. Whereas you know, since then, and particularly over the last 10 to 20 years, there's been an increased focus on also modelling 
changes in biodiversity over time. And that can be modeling changes both past to present, in other words, applications to monitoring. It can also be um, modeling about changes that we think might occur in the future. So in other words, future projections and, and, and scenario analyses, particularly to inform um, policy formulation and decision making. So the, the other changes that we've, we've seen has have been um, broadening out from just thinking about modelling biodiversity at the species level to also um, working on modelling at the genetic level and also at the whole ecosystem level and also thinking more in terms of modelling um, changes in, in other dimensions of, of biodiversity besides the, the compositional dimensions, also functional and structural diversity. And then the third main change is, is probably the one of um, integrating across a much wider range of spatial scales than, than used to happen in, in the old days. So it's important to note, I think, here that um, ALA data have been used extensively, at least in you know, work that, that I and my colleagues at CSIRO have been doing since I came to CSIRO about 14 years ago we've made very extensive use of, of ALA data for a whole range of national scale applications. And I've just got a couple of examples there out of a, a, a much larger number that I could be showing you. But you know, everything from, from assessing the representativeness of Australia's national reserve system through to um, looking at, at priorities for 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 the management actions to, to, to help biodiversity adapt to climate change. Then going back about, oh, it must be about seven or eight years now, our, our team then expanded our, our, our focus, broadened our focus to, to think about um, applications of, of modeling at, at the global scale. And this is where um, GBIF, data really came in, into play for us. And so the, the modelling work that we've done at, at global scale over recent years has made very extensive use of, of GBIF data. And that's actually been for, for over 400,000 species of, of plants, vertebrates and, and invertebrates globally. And so those, those data have been integrated with a whole range of, um, of remotely sensed information and then um, you know, all put together with macroecological modeling techniques running on high performance computing to allow us to assess change in biodiversity across the entire land surface of the planet. And so this, these modeling approaches have, have in, in turn fed into some, some very high profile global scenario analyses that have been run um, going back a few years now, and these were um, projecting expected impacts of, of, of climate and land use scenarios globally. These in turn fed into some, some big international collaborations between multiple modelling groups around the world. Um, you might have seen at least one of the, the papers from this, the, the Nature paper, by, by Leclerc et al, um, which basically led to and inspired a lot of the, the recent rhetoric around bending the curve of, of biodiversity loss and trying to achieve a, a nature positive outcome for the planet. And so those scenario analysis um, um, initiatives also then fed in to some of the, the, the biggest findings and messages from the Intergovernmental Platform for Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services Assessment Report on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services for the, for the planet. And that has, you know, in turn motivated and inspired a lot of what has come since in terms of the, the raising of the profile of, of biodiversity loss as a major, major global crisis. Okay. The, the, um, that, that global modeling. Capability and again, you know, with all of the input from from GBIF data into the establishment of those models, that that's also fed in 
to the derivation of a number of global indicators that CSIRO has, has developed. And these are more focused on, on monitoring and reporting how, how the, the, the system is, is changing in terms of the expected retention and persistence of, of biodiversity. And so a number of these, these indicators have been adopted by the, the CBD, CBD process. Um, and in fact, with the forthcoming um, deliberations at the, the big biodiversity COP coming up in a few weeks, um, one of our indicators, the Bioclimatic Ecosystem Resilience Index, or the BERI, is actually being um, considered for adoption as a headline indicator for, for one of the targets within the, the draft Global Biodiversity Framework. And that's for, for target eight, which is the, um, the target to do with biodiversity and climate change. So, so that, that very index is all about measuring the capacity of landscapes to retain species diversity in the face of climate change as a function of the area integrity and connectivity of natural ecosystems. So, so, so if, if approved at the forthcoming COP, this, this indicator, including, you know, all of the GBIF data that, that go into it will, will have to be reported on by, by, by every country in the world. Okay. Just briefly to turn to, um, some of the advances that have been made in, in the how of biodiversity modeling, and there are just so many of these. So I'm just going to touch on a few as, as, as examples. Um, you know, one of the most active areas, including by our team over, over the past 10 years or so, has been in trying to, to better couple correlative and mechanistic approaches to, to modeling. And there's been a long running debate between different factions around, you know, the, the relative pros and cons of correlative versus mechanistic approaches. But I think it's fair to say that there's now, you know, a reasonable consensus that the best way forward is actually integrating these much more, more closely and getting the, get, getting the, the, the respective benefits of, of both. And so just one example I put up there from some work of our team a few years back incorporating mechanistic modeling of evolutionary adaptation into, um, correlative modeling of predicted um, distribution of shifts of species as a result of, of climate change. And then another you know, really important emerging area of, of, of innovation and modeling is, is making better use of multiple data streams from new observation technologies. And I'm sure many of you are, are aware of advances in things like, like eDNA sampling, um, and then on the remote sensing side, we've got the advent of space-borne hyperspectral imagery, which allows, you know, things like being able to actually identify individual plant species from, from remote sensing. So, so these are real game changers, but they, they present some, some really interesting challenges for modeling in terms of, of how to take maximum advantage of these new observation technologies and how to, to actually combine them within a, within a single model. And then just, just to finish, um, I just wanted to mention one final modeling challenge, which is occupying a lot of our time at the moment. And, and this is a challenge of, I think, of particular relevance to both the ALA and to GBIF more generally. And it's around this, this whole challenge of how to make better use of, um, of species observation data sets that are relatively unstructured in, in nature. So when we think about biodiversity monitoring, detecting change in biodiversity over time, then the gold standard is very much going out and applying the same monitoring technique at the same places over time. But with the explosion of things like um, citizen science smartphone apps, a large proportion of the biodiversity data for the world will increasingly be relatively unstructured species of current records. So observations of species at different locations over time rather than at exactly the same locations based on repeated visits. So there's this huge 
modeling and analytical challenge now as to how to make better use of these data sets to extract the signal of biodiversity change from them. And so I just wanted to mention a, a, a project that we've had running for a while now, which has been jointly funded by Microsoft AI for Earth and, and GeoBond and with the EBVs on the cloud initiative. And this is all about now starting to use cloud-based analytics to, to, to detect change in species composition of communities from unstructured species occurrence data as a function of environmental change across both space and time. So this is, you know, a really exciting frontier. Now, what, watch this space, I think, over the next year, year or two in, some, in terms of development of some new approaches that can extract much greater value from the sorts of data sets that, that the ALA and, and GBIF work with. Okay, I think that's about all I was going to say, Martin, so I'll let, um, let you hand over to the next speaker. Thank yeah, you. no worries. Thanks, Simon. And thanks for, I mean, such a comprehensive overview of, of those years of research. It's, it's really, it's funny, like I, I work in this space myself, not, not on the research angle so much as yourself, but, it, um, you know, I have some awareness of it. And yet you lay it out like that and suddenly you do see all that progress in, in over, over the years of, of, of research. It's quite incredible to see it laid out in, in one place. Um, we're going to keep questions for the end. Uh, for those of you uh, watching at home, we have, um, you will notice there's, a, there's an option to, to uh, type in your own questions for our speakers. We're going to have uh, a little bit of time left over after everyone's given their presentations. And, and if you've got questions you'd like me to ask, then feel free to drop them in there. For now, we're going to hand over to, uh, to Carla, if you're okay with that. Yeah, thanks, Martin. I'm just going to share my screen. No worries. Yep, that's come through perfectly. Thanks, Carla. Over to you. Great. Um, yeah, thanks, Martin, for um, that really awesome introduction and timeline. Um, it really saves me a lot of time in terms of covering background. So I really appreciate that. It's so amazing to hear about your research in this space. Um, I also just want to thank everyone for joining us today. As Martin mentioned, my name is Carla Archibald, and I'm a postdoc at Deakin University. I'm going to be going through a case study where I've been using ALA data in action. So I'm going to be sharing some biodiversity modelling work that I've been doing in the context of a land use change model and land use change modelling in Australia. But firstly, I just want to acknowledge the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations as the traditional owners of the land in which I work and am presenting from today. And I pay my respects to their elders past and present. So the majority of land in Australia is used for agriculture, from extensive livestock grazing in more natural systems to intensive cropping lands that are often more modified. This land use is also responsible for various environmental impacts such as greenhouse gas emissions, extensive nutrient and pesticide use, invasive species and native habitat loss and modification. There are many farms and businesses that have found a balance between business and biodiversity and nature conservation. But in general, there's a lot of opportunity across the land use and food system to take a more sustainable approach to land use and management. So to tackle this challenge, the Land Use Futures Project emerged and is a joint collaboration between Climate Work Centre, Deakin University and CSIRO. The goal of the Land Use Futures Project is to inform the transformation of Australia's food and land use system to address and adapt to climate change. Deakin's role within this broader project was to revamp the land use trade-offs model, which is known as the LUTO model. Um, this model helps us model land use change through time, and it allows us to test various sustainable transition scenarios for Australian food and land systems. Many people have involved, been involved in the previous version of LUTO, example, Simon, um, and many people are still involved in this work, led by Professor Brett Bryan, including Dr. Fiala Dahan, Dr. Michalis Hajikaku from Deakin, as well as colleagues from CSIRO and Climateworks. So the LUTO 2.0 is an integrated environmental and economic uh, model which estimates Australian land use futures under alternative global and policy scenarios. The way that this model works is that it allocates agricultural, 
carbon and conservation land use types using a demand driven optimization model that's constrained by meeting sustainability goals, including biodiversity goals, as well as by the additional cost and effort it would take to transition from one land use, for example, beef grazing, to another land use, for example, apples. This model used um, the land use and land management in 2010 National Land Use Map as the starting point and models land use change at the one kilometre squared scale out into 2100. As inputs, the LUTO 2.0 model takes into account land use, land management, environmental data, including biodiversity data, as well as economic data. Using optimization, the model identifies optimal land use arrangements based on food demand, including um, internal as well as exported, production costs of a commodity, and um, as well as meeting sustainability targets. It then generates extensive reporting on economics and sustainability. And biodiversity is considered during these three steps or phases. So one major priority was to incorporate a finer scale um, biodiversity data at the species level, as well as to consolidate climate change impacts using the updated CMIP-6 climate scenarios. So the first task by how climate change may impact the amount of suitable climate space for species. To do so, I collaborated with Dr. Erin Graham at JCU as she was a part of the team that developed the CLIMAS data, which some of you may be familiar with. I adopted the same modeling procedure of Graham et al. 2019, which utilized ALA occurrence data, DEHP occurrence data, bioclimatic variables, as well as a maxet model. I reapplied the CLIMAS models to the updated CMIP-6 climate scenarios, as well as extended the CLIMAS models to also include vascular plants. This procedure used eight bioclimatic variables to model climate space, which included mean annual temperature, temperature seasonality, mean temperature of the warmest and coldest quarters, mean annual precipitation, precipitation seasonality, and precipitation of the wettest and driest quarter. I applied these models to 10,608 species in total, which was about 1,400 terrestrial vertebrates and 9,200 vascular plants. I modeled um, species climate suitability for a baseline scenario, as well as four future time periods out to 2100 under four SSPs using seven GCMs, and I then calculated an ensemble average of those GCMs for each climate scenario. This resulted in over a million rasters containing the climate suitability for species over time under different climate scenarios. We now have spatially explicit data for over 10,000 species that's representative of a bit of a climate niche under these different climate scenarios. So I've done some summary statistics using this data and to no surprise, climate change is expected to ne negatively affect Australia's terrestrial biodiversity with 44% of vascular plants and 47% of terrestrial vertebrate species predicted to lose at least half of their suitable climate space by 2100 under the most severe climate scenario, which was SSP5, RCP 8.5. But taking the green road, and mitigating climate change is predicted to greatly reduce the number of species that are negatively impacted by climate change. I also quantified climate refugia as the proportion of overlapping climate space in the baseline scenario and the future projection in 2100. And I found that as climate scenario worsened, the proportion of that overlap between the baseline and the future climate space that was still suitable declined. I'm working on writing this analysis up as a journal article, but I'm happy to discuss my results at a later date if you're interested. The next step for us was to synthesize at the species level that climate suitability data into a biodiversity priority layer that we can use to help us guide conservation action in the LUTO 2.0 model. So our objective with, with this was to establish a climate robust biodiversity priority layer and we use donation. So to do so, I use the ensemble averaged climate niche data 
at five time periods as features within a zonation prioritization. This resulted in five layers per species, so it ended up being 53,000 features in total per climate scenario. I used the core area algorithm and a retention mask of natural lands, which we defined as protected areas, indigenous lands, and other effective conservation measures, OECMs. And so what that did was force the prioritization to include these areas so that the remaining areas that were ranked reflected the most complementary areas to protect given what was already protected or what was already natural, I guess, in our definition. This priority layer helps the LUTO 2.0 decide where to allocate new protected areas out until 2030, as well as which areas provide the greatest biodiversity benefits for restoration action. The final step involved developing a framework and the data to report on how land use change impacts biodiversity. So for the reporting, we adopted a system of environmental economic accounts or SEA style accounting framework. And so one objective was in terms of like the underlying data that we needed to report. And so what we did was we basically needed to construct because we have so much data here, we needed to construct a raster which represented the contribution of each grid cell to all species climate space. And so by doing that, this layer allowed us to efficiently sum across cells to quantify the proportion of climate space that's covered by different land use types. So to do that, for each species year and climate scenario, we calculated the contribution of each grid cell, and so there were 7 million grid cells in total, to the total climate space within that raster. We then aggregated species based on taxonomic group, so we summed the rasters and then we rescaled based on the number of species. The resulting layer represents the contribution of each grid cell towards species, like all species climate space. This method also helped us emphasize places where they're small ranging species because the contribution of each grid cell towards that species total climate space is much greater than what it would be for a wide ranging species. So this biodiversity reporting layer helps the LUTO 2.0 efficiently report and present changes in biodiversity over time under different climate scenarios and land use types. So with all of that being said and done, there's still a lot for us to do. The LUTO 2.0 model is still under active development and we've not yet totally implemented biodiversity into the model. So I'm sure there'll be lots of tweaks and refinements to the way that which biodiversity is used as an input or constrains land use within the optimization or is reported on. For, um, for example, um, I've been working to enhance the biodiversity data that we're using as inputs by refitting the model to also include environmental variables as opposed to just bioclims. The team at Deakin are also working on various publications so we can begin to share some of the data that we've been working on as well as the methods. But yeah, please get in touch if you wanna learn any more about the biodiversity modeling aspects that I've touched on today or the broader project. And yeah, so thank you all for listening. And I just wanted to take a moment to thank you for joining us and to thank Martin and Kylie from ALA for emceeing and for organizing. So I'll throw it back to you, Martin. It's lovely. Thanks, Carla. And look, that's amazing talk. The the extent to which you're able to make these continental scale projections now and, and, and that are actionable and you can use to inform decisions is quite incredible. Um, I don't, I don't, you, you just don't see that stuff much unless you, you, you researchers such as yourself are willing to share it. So, so thanks for bringing that along. And uh, Payel, our last speaker from University of Melbourne, thanks for, for coming along. Are you able to share your screen? I am. Um... And we're seeing some questions come into the, uh, into the chat as well. So if, um, if anyone has any questions for Carla or Payel after this current talk, then uh, feel free to, to add those in as well. And uh, I can see that perfectly. Payel, over to you. Thanks, Martin. Um... Good afternoon, um, everyone, and yeah, thanks again, Martin and everyone, for the opportunity to speak um, with the CSIRO audience and also to be part of, let me remove my <laughs> video from there first. 
um, also um, to speak amongst uh, Gala and Simon. I feel really honored to speak amongst work that is so wide and so has so many applications. Um, so I will talk about the ideas in biodiversity modeling from the perspective of um, my research at the University of Melbourne. Um, so I'm speaking from Melbourne, uh, from the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations, and I'd like to acknowledge that. I, I feel incredibly um, honored to be uh, on these lands. Um, so at uh, the university with Brendan and other uh, collaborators who I will introduce as I go through the talk, we are building um, the capability to predict at national and global scales what will happen to biodiversity under uh, different future scenarios. And by future, we're aiming to uh, encompass a whole suite of environment and socioeconomic factors. So hopefully as I go through the talk, you'll be able to see how the work that we're doing is situated among uh, in what um, Simon Ferrier introduced as well as what Carla is doing because we've got quite a few links of collaboration amongst um, each other as well as the wider community that is working on biodiversity modeling. Um, so um, when I say um, under different future scenarios, what I mean is we're not looking only at climate and land use um, and the impacts of these on biodiversity, but also recognizing that climate and land use are themselves driven by processes like uh, population growth, trade, demand for resources, um, and production and consumption preferences and patterns. So what are these drivers? We're quite um, familiar with, um, more, with all of these. Um, we know land use has has changed drastically with large increases in um, agricultural land and loss of natural ecosystems as countries have moved through stages of economic, social, and demographic change. Climate continues to change um, and is without a doubt attributable um, in part to human activities, activities that also drive land use change and in turn have consequences for, for natural systems and their biodiversity. Um, trade which is the other key uh, driver uh, and which allows for the flow of resources to facilitate either existing or emerging patterns of uh, resource production and consumption. Uh, we've seen international trade um, has increased steadily over the last 20 years and is expected to do so um, with the growth of free trade agreements. And then, of course, there is um, human behavior and choices, be they at the individual or collective um, level which drive much of these processes. So what we choose to eat and where um, might drive uh, systems of production and environmental impacts on the other side of the planet. So things like uh, palm oil, quinoa, coffee or meat, if you think about these, are just some of the common examples that make that telecoupling obvious, the coupling between consumption and production and the displacement of where some of these impacts might be happening as a result of consumption patterns. So the aim of the work that we're doing at Melbourne University really is to understand how these broader global processes of consumption, production, trade, climate can drive some of the more local level impacts on land use as well as biodiversity and how this, this um, capability to be able to predict biodiversity and land use under these kinds of scenarios can inform environmental and policy targets. Um, so how do we capture the influence of these broader uh, processes, environment, environmental, social, and economic? Uh, we do this, or we think we can, by building an integrated or coupled modeling framework to capture these ideas of interacting drivers and their impacts. But we, uh, one of the key um, aims of uh, our research is to do this in a dramatically simplified, transparent, and reproducible way which is often uncharacteristic, uncharacteristic of integrated assessment models. Um, to build the, this kind of a model, we are bringing together expertise in economic land use and biodiversity models. So uh, we use an economic model, which gives us, um, which is here, so we use an economic model which gives us change in commodity demand. So for example, wheat, rice, coal, what have you, in the future under different scenarios or a policy. Now commodities are then linked to um, uh, specific land use classes such that the quantity of demand for a commodity is linked to 
the area that is required to produce that commodity. So that's how we, um, that's how the outputs of the economic model feed into the land use model. And predicted land use uh, is then used as a variable in within the species distribution models. Um, so I will step through um, the framework um, just so you can see it's not an abstract con concept. You can see what we're doing in this project. Um, as, as a first step, we define uh, our scenarios. Um, and so these might be climate scenarios or what we know as the RCPs um, that lead to specific changes in temperature. Um, these might uh, also be uh, SSPs or what are known as shared socioeconomic pathways. Now, these are narratives or storylines that describe alternate futures for the world based on assumptions around economy, lifestyle, policy, education, and the environment. So we um, so they cover a breadth of um, uh, of scenarios that might go from dystopian futures of um, fossil fuel heavy use and depletion to more sustainable futures. Um, and these scenarios are represented as quantitative time series data on um, um, aspects such as population, GDP, energy, use and supply, amongst other, other things. We can also consider policy decisions relating to, say, trade or climate, or explore pathways to meet targets, such as those that are set by the Global Biodiversity Framework. Um, and also um, look at specific scenarios, say, that describe societal behavioral change. For example, dietary shift towards scenarios that move away from um, a meat-focused diet. Um, so we capture these scenarios um, using an economic model. The economic model modeling component is handled by what is known as CGEs, Computable General Equilibrium Models. This work is led by um, Tom Compass at the University of Melbourne and Van Ha Pham at ANU uh, and Matthew Cantel, who is a PhD student at the University of Melbourne, is now working on these models. CGEs are basically models that look at the economy as a whole, as a system of um, interdependent components. So industries, consumers, governments, importers and exporters uh, or interacting with each other. So they are usually formulated as a set of equations which describe the economic behavior of each of these agents. And so they can predict the response of the economy in response to a policy, uh, in response to economic shocks, um, and more recently um, to measures to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. These models are um, extremely complex with many equations and parameters, and at the moment the model can cover up to over 100 uh, regions, countries, and uh, more than 60 or so commodities. So the strength of the um, project that we're working on lies in this collaboration and it being able to show how these complex and diverse set of inputs translate into impacts on biodiversity. What we get from the CGE in our case is projected demands for commodities and different policies or scenarios. So this is um, just to show uh, what that might look like under a business as usual and an example scenario. Here the scenario that we were testing was um, a trade liberalization scenario for Vietnam. And so we can see that um, the CGE can tell us what that change in um, commodity demand might be in relation to a 2015 um, baseline. The next step in the framework um, was the land use modeling, which has three steps. Uh, the first is where we estimate the total area of land, um, total area of land use types or classes that are required to meet these uh, projected demands for the different commodities. And I'll talk um, a little bit more about that in the next slide. Um, so we first establish the total demand for different land use types. Then we have a land use suitability model, which is a regression based model, much like um, biodiversity uh, species distribution models, which predict uh, where a particular land use is likely to occur, given the predictor variables of soil and climate and proximity to roads and such. So this bit gives us the suitability of a grid cell for the different land use classes. And then the third step 
which captures the spatial interactions and competition between the land use classes. So here we determine how um, land use, the different classes are distributed across the study area in the landscape. Um, so for the first step where we uh, wanted to establish the, um, estimate the total demand for land to be able to satisfy the production of the um, quantities of production of commodities as is suggested by the CGE. Um, we first, as a first step, we link the commodities from the CGE to specific land use classes. And here I've shown you one of the earlier versions of um, uh, how we were doing this in the framework where we selected um, a handful of commodities that were um, that were predicted where we had predicted demands for these commodities from the CGE and linked them clearly to land use classes. And so we assumed that an increase or a decrease in the demand for the commodity is linked to um, a corresponding increase or decrease in the surface area of land that's required to produce that commodity. So there's a simplifying assumption which says there's a linear change and we use a multiplier based on that proportional change in demand for a commodity between now and in the future. What we get from this step is um, the area for each land use class required as per our scenarios. We're currently thinking about how to bring in more detail in terms of the land use classes in, these step, uh, in this step, as well as how to better link the CGE output. So instead of assuming this kind of a simple linear relationship between demand and land area, getting the CGE itself to give us land areas required for the production of different commodities. And this work is being led by uh, Matthew Cantel, the PhD student. Um, in, the, in, the, uh, in the next step, um, and this is just a placeholder slide, you don't need to read through the, the text, is, this is just to say this is where we estimate the land use suitability based on these kinds of variables, um, topographic, climate, soil, um, and so on. And then we come to that, that third step of um, allocation, land use allocation. So now that we have the total area that we um, uh, that is required per land use class and the suitability of the landscape, so the pixels in the landscape for, for the different land use classes, we then start to decide how to put, where to put the different land use classes in that landscape. And the initial ideas for um, this um, part of the land use model came from the clues model, where allocation is determined by establishing some rules between how land use classes will transition from one to the other. So this is defined according to um, elasticity matrices that indicate the time and the plausibility of land use transition given the current state. So for example, uh, forests are not allowed to um, transition into shrubland and are only allowed to change to cropland if the transition is happening outside a designated uh, protected area. Um, and for shrubland to change into forest, we can define um, a time lag to allow for the time for succession to occur in the land if, less, if left um, undisturbed. So we, what we get out of the at the end of these three steps of the land use modeling component is a predicted land use map under the scenario of the policy being assessed. Um, and we are currently working uh, on, on improving uh, this method to represent the elasticities based on existing data rather than um, just a, a rule-based kind of um, a transition between land use classes. Um, and Skip, who is part of the project, Skip Nguli, he is leading um, that part of the work. And then finally, we come to the biodiversity models. Again, regression-based models. Many of you will be familiar with some of these uh, uh, models. Carla's talked about Maxen modeling um, um, already. Simon mentioned correlative models, which is the kind of models we're using, not me mechanistic models at, at the moment. Um, uh, but here, really, the idea is that you, you, sh you should be able to use any type of biodiversity model. For the purpose of this project, we're interested in individual species responses, so we're building individual SDMs. And so the focus in this step really is about uh, developing the approaches and the code based on existing methods of point process modeling and available uh, R packages so that we can handle more species 
and greater spatial resolution in the models. So this, but this also requires um, decisions um, in the data used and how we claim this data. So currently we're running these models uh, and our framework for um, Australia, we have some way to go yet to do this globally, uh, which make your use of ALA data on birds, mammals, and reptiles. And so in a sense, when you're dealing with data um, at that scale and for that many species, modeling biodiversity also becomes partly a data science question in, in, in a project like ours. Um, so where are we at? Um, I see I'm running over time, Martin, I'm going to be quick. Um, while the project uh, is pushing for the conceptual development in each of the models, as well as the links between these models, we focused on a few key areas. One of the main challenges of the project was getting our heads around the economic model, the CG model terminology and, and the software. Um, and so based on a systematic review that was conducted by Matthew um, and his subsequent work on CGE models, we see what type of models are out there and what they're used for. But more importantly, we um, now have a better sense of the understanding of gaps and opportunities for using these models to inform environmental and biodiversity assessments. So we have insight on uh, the commodities and regions represented and how we can either split or combine these to make it re relevant for biodiversity assessment. So for example, combining annual or agroforestry crops. We also um, know that these models are poor in representing forest or unmanaged landscapes, and that's something we need to work, um, put more thought into for our work. We understand some of the fixed param parameters in these models. So for example, the uh, parameters that can um, um, modulate the uh, openness of trade, so free trade flows, and so we can play with this to be able to model different trade scenarios, but also um, play around with model closure. So basically, so what we can get as the output from, from the model. So whether we want commodity demands or land area required for production. Um, Matthew is also developing an open um, R version of the CGE model, although how free it can be made given that we're playing in um, economists' territory remains to be tested. Um, and finally, we're also thinking about how better to model the SSPs through uh, the CGE. Simon Kapitza, who did his PhD at the University of Melbourne, used the framework to look at um, direct and indirect impacts of climate change on biodiversity. So he, he included climate variable directly in the STMs versus through the economic land use biodiversity route. And this work highlighted the importance of improving our land use uh, models, which was then the focus of his PhD and also a focus of our current work. So Simon has now developed a, a fractional land use change model, which is a marked improvement over other available models, which could only make categorical predictions. Um, and with this, and it, with this model, we are able to pick up the detail that uh, might be crucial to explain patterns in species occurrence, for example, of range restricted species living in highly fragmented habitats. This model is also open source and the model code is available freely. We've looked at impacts of trade liberal, liberalization agreements on biodiversity. Bear in mind that the work so far has been on um, methodological developments um, and so uh, we are continuing to improve or gain confidence in the outputs of our assessments yet. So these analyses can indicate, um, depending on the attributes of the species, that one scenario might be better uh, than the other, but this may not be consistent across the species. So it's important to be able to make these assessments, yes, for a lot of species, but also to look at individual species if we want to inform meaningful um, policy decisions. And similarly, we've been able to do that um, to do a similar analysis for the SSPs, although I am hesitant to show maps at the moment because a lot remains to be fixed. But this is where we want to get to eventually, have outputs that tell us where across the globe, where will there be the greatest conflicts and opportunities for economic, social and environmental incentives. Um, and that brings us to where we go to next. As um, I resonate with Carla's uh, picture. <laughs> there is no dearth of options as to what to move on to. There's heaps to be done. Um, and in addition to some of the technical challenges or 
of scaling up these analyses for global assessments, we also need to think conceptually about the SSP and uh, CGE link. So that is how to better represent the shared socioeconomic scenarios using the economic model. This has so far been the weakest link in, in, our, in our modeling framework. Uh, we want to include greater detail in the land use classes that are used in the fr framework. So we have some promising ideas in that space, um, thanks to the work of PhD students in, in our wider network. What metrics we use, again, there's a lot of expertise um, here, um, as well as in the wider network as to which biodiversity metrics to use. Uh, and of course, these are the decision on what to use depends on what you want to inform, but we would like to weigh the strengths and weaknesses of some of these metrics. Um, and the big base, the model evaluation and quantifying uncertainty, big, something that we um, move towards as we start to tighten the different sub-models of the framework. Um, and with that, uh, and crossly over time, um, thank you. And that's the team who I've been working with. That's wonderful. Thanks, Payal. No, look, I, I totally understand that there's so much we could we could talk about here and, and, and we could quite easily fill two hours, I'm sure. We do have uh, nine minutes or so left, So, um, and we have been receiving some, some questions from the chat. I guess, to, to me, just uh, what, watching those talks, a common theme is uh, how we can use data from different sources to, to make decisions, whether it's about conservation or land use or economics or some combination of, of, of all the above. Um, you mentioned at the end there that, that, that validating models of this, this size and complexity is, is challenging. Is, is that, um, it seems we're at the stage where we can build complex models. Can we test them? We, so from, for our uh, project, do you test them in which sense, Martin? Well, I, I, <laughs> what, which indeed, you, you tell me. I guess um, if we're trying to make uh, inference about a, a complex e economic system, for example, that's only subject to so much control, right? So, yes, true. So, great question. Obviously, don't have the uh, all the answers, um, but we can start to test parts of that framework. We we are some way off in trying to test um, the economic model, the uncertainty associate. Uh, 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 uncertainty within that component of the framework and the and the outputs that we get how closely they align to um you know expectation there are methods where you can do that where you can um go back a few years predict to uh, a year that you have data for and then compare what the economic model is doing but each of those models for example will have a different method as to how we're testing for the validity of of the outputs, so I'm I am yeah I'm not sure how I'll be able to answer that for the for the framework yet as to we can start to have outputs um, and how we how we start to test them. It, one of the approaches that does we've been talking about does come to mind is comparing what we get with what with what Carla has been doing and Brett's team has been doing. So comparing those different kinds of land use models, what they're saying, what our land use model might be saying and, and what the different biodiversity outputs they're getting from their methods. So that's one way that I can think of. That may... I was going to pass to Carla, but Simon, yeah. Oh, if, if Carla wants to go first, that's, that's fine. I just have like something quick to add. I guess another... I guess, advantage of me basically just like updating the climax layers is we have the old climax data to compare my results with. So that's something that I'll be working with Erin to do. And um, I guess the cool thing about the climate, the climax workflow is that they um, brought a lot of ecologists into the room to do a bit of ground truthing, or I guess like expert input on those outputs so it's not ground truthing in that you've predicted an area to be suitable for wombats on a map at this level and then you go to that area to survey for wombats but brought ecologists into the room just to do a bit of like a bullshit test i don't know another word for that um on the output layers cool i i, I use sanity check more but I'm, i'll i'll try both in future so that's sorry simon yeah look just on that of 
evaluation question. There, there are a lot of aspects of these models that we'll only be able to evaluate through future observations, which mm -hmm. is why you know ongoing monitoring is is so important. Um, but, but there are some components that we can evaluate by by looking backwards. And I think Bael mentioned that one of the most interesting collaborations I've been involved with going back a number of years now was with um, some fossil pollen workers in, in North America who had who had the most amazing fossil pollen records stretching back 20,000 years. And they also have excellent climate reconstruction over that same period. So we, we actually worked with them to test um, some of our modelling approaches by, by fitting models at one point in time within the past 20,000 years and then making predictions or projections across other time periods based just on um, changes in, in, in climate. And the, 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 those projections stood up remarkably well, which is, which is very encouraging for the, for the widespread use of correlative models in this case to, to project what we think might happen to biological distributions under climate change. No, it's, a, it's a fascinating point, isn't it? I, I guess um, with, with two talks in particular focusing on, on a, an interaction between economy and, and biodiversity, which has not been my field of study, for example, and that was very, very novel to me, um, it occurs to me that, that um, in effect, the state of the economy is fairly well um, observable, right? And, and yet, we, as we perhaps all know and have seen, um, it's not easy to control the economy. You know, even for organisations like the governments or the Reserve Bank, how much harder is it when we're trying to um, trying to manage things like biodiversity, where the state is itself difficult to to observe? Right, we, we're we're dealing with um, imperfect information on the state of biodiversity in the country at any one time. Do, does anyone have a view on on that and how that that lack of no knowledge of state makes it harder for us to make decisions? Well, sure. I can. I have a um, comment. I don't know if it's helpful, but we think economic data is very reliable, <laughs> and we know there is imperfections in that data as well. But I think we've um, we can learn a lot in from economic methods and approaches how they have dealt with some of these things. Sometimes it's assumptions. Sometimes it's black box methods, which is not what we want to do, of course, but that, but we can learn from economic, um, some of those approaches as to how they do with an imperfect, imperfect data. Simon? Uh, I, I, I don't really have much to add other than, you know, I've, I've spent 40 years making use of best available data at any point in time to help people make decisions. People make decisions regardless of the state of the information base. So the, the constant challenge is to make best possible use of the information that you've got at the same time as encouraging activities that will improve that information base over mm -hmm. time. And one of the things I get very frustrated by with some of my um, academic colleagues <laughs> is any suggestion that we have more than enough information on, 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 on biodiversity, on the natural world generally. And we actually need you know, more information on, for example, the economic dimensions of things. I, mm. We haven't got time for it now, but I, I <laughs> would argue very strongly that that is not the case. We definitely need better information on, on biodiversity. And one point of your talk, Simon, was that the uh, the opportunities, but potentially challenges as well, of, of new data sources, including um, citizen science observations, things like iNaturalist, Frog ID, eBird, any things like that. Um, do you see there's an opportunity there for, for new techniques and, and new learnings? Oh, com completely. But, but as I was hinting at there, I think they also present some new challenges for modelling. And... You know, that example I gave of relatively unstructured species occurrence data sets is, is, is a good one. Sure, we can sort of put our head in the sand and say, oh, the only valid monitoring data are where you go out and apply exactly the same survey technique at the same places over time. Um, but that's then ignoring the potential value that we can get from an absolutely enormous and ever-increasing 
source of data distributed over time that, that has to have useful information in it if only we can learn to analyze it more effectively. No, take that point. Well, we're at time, we're for an hour. So um, thank you so much to all three of you for, for presenting today. It was fascinating to hear about your research and thank you to everyone who's, who's joined in from home or maybe streaming this after the event. Um, yeah, this is the last webinar